Now, lab-wise, some of this look should, should look familiar. Our stomach is in the upper left quadrant, so it's kind of hanging out over here. You saw it on the cadaver. It's there just for temporarily storing food. Helps break it down a little bit, and it takes that bolus of food, ball of food, and it breaks, on to, breaks it down into what we now call chyme. Chyme generally doesn't really rec, you know, it doesn't really look like it's like your recognizable food anymore. It's further broken down. We've got acid mixing in, lots of churning. It's kind of this liquidy fluid, you know, liquidy food now. We call that chyme. You know, bolus, it still kind of looks like your food. By the time we call it chyme in your stomach, it doesn't really look as recognizable as when you ate it. Now, the different parts of the stomach, just as a review, the cardio region or the cardio region is right there at the top. Uh, the cardio orifice is just the hole that goes from the esophagus into the stomach. The fundus is the top part. The body is the main part. The pylorus region is the end part, the little tiny funnel. And at the very end, we've got the pyloric sphincter or pyloric valve that can open and close, allowing food to go into the small intestine. So it's all the little muscles there. Now, purpose of the pyloric sphincter or valve? Valve. Prevent backflow, even of food. Once food goes into the intestines, we don't want it going backward. So we have a sphincter here. Once food goes into the stomach, we don't want it going back up into the esophagus. So we've got these sphincters, valves, like they're just a little fancier muscle with it, uh, that are preventing backflow of food, you know, whether you call it food at that point or not. A couple other parts. The outer part of it, we call the greater curvature, greater curvature, the inner part, the smaller one, we call the lesser curvature. And it also has two kind of fatty tissues that are coming off of those curvature. Now, one's called the lesser omentum, one's called the greater omentum. It depends on which curvature they're attached to. The greater omentum is attached to the greater curvature. Yes, and I'm like, they do have lots of fat deposits. The greater omentum was that fat apron. That on cadaver. But I'm like, it's the fat apron. It's hanging off of the stomach on the greater curvature. The lesser omentum goes, oh, okay, I might as well just kept it on here. It goes from the lesser curvature of the stomach and it attaches up to the liver. Now, that fat apron, yes, does provide some protection and some energy source because there is fat there. But I'm like, I was going to say, it kind of between the two of them, it keeps the stomach in place. So it's not jostling around quite as much. There's another picture just of the greater momentum, but peeled back so we could see everything. Now, the stomach still has everything in the digestive system has your four basic layers. And then depending on where you are in the digestive system, they can be slightly modified. So we still have the four layers of tissue. The difference is in the stomach. The, mu the muscularis layer is a little bit different and the mucosa layer is a little bit different. The part with the muscularis layer, generally there are two layers of muscles in the entire intestinal wall. That's kind of your, usually two layers of muscles in the whole GI, GI tract. In the stomach, we have an extra layer of muscle. It's an inner oblique layer. So one goes this way, the other one goes this way, and then this one usually goes at an angle, although they're not really showing an angle, but they go at angles with each other. The extra oblique layer allows that whole stomach to squeeze and churn. Instead of just squeezing and moving things top down, now we're allowing it to squeeze and go backwards and forward and really try to mix up all of that food in there. So it's got this extra muscle layer in there. The mucosa, also really different, because what type of environment do you find in the stomach? Would you want to live in the stomach? Not really, why? It's very acidic. It's not a great place to live. Now, the stomach has to compensate for that. And so it's made of simple columnar. You can see the single columnar. Simple columnar epithelium, and it has lots of mucus cells. Now, the mucus cells secrete an alkaline mucus. So it's a base. It helps neutralize the acid that some of the other cells make. They also 
by helping them, to help make them alkaline, they trap bicarbonate rich fluid. Where else have we seen bicarbonate before? What system? The respiratory is going to come back today. The respiratory and the digestive, all that, you know, everything's all connected. But the bicarbonate ions, yes, the actual mucus can trap some of the bicarbonate ions. The bicarbonate is alkaline and it can trap some of it in there and it makes this kind of nice layer so that the acid that's in the stomach doesn't wear away at the tissue below it. Now also when we look at the inside of the stomach, we have these little pits, these little tiny holes all over. Well, if you look down into the hole, as we're doing on this one, we have, it leads down into what we call our gastric glands. Anytime you have a gland, a gland produces some type of secretion. So your sweat glands, they produce sweat. So your gastric glands are gonna be secreting gastric fluid or gastric juices. And <laughs> because there are different colors on here, it's because there are different cells that we find in those gastric glands making different components to our gastric juices. So there are four main cells that we find in our gastric glands. We have the mucus neck cells. <laughs> it tells you what they do. They do secrete mucus. However, the mucus that these particular cells make that were found down in here, not up in the epithelial tissue on the top, is they make a thin acidic mucus versus an alkaline mucus. We don't know why <laughs> we make an, a, an acidic mucus down in here. So it's unknown function. We just know that these particular ones make a really thin acidic layer. The other three, you're gonna have to know these cells. The other three, there's the parietal, and I know I've got next slides on them. There's the cheap, and the entero, and oh, cringe, because I'm gonna leave some of the notes up here. So I'm gonna be writing it too. Now, the gastric gland secretions between these three additional cells and the little bit that those mucus, uh, the mucus cells make, they make lots and lots of gastric juices. Like we make, is it three liters? I don't care that you know the number. It's like three liters of gastric juice a day. The uh, juices that our stomach is making. Now, the parietal cell makes two main secretions. One, it makes the hydrochloric acid. Our stomach acid is due to the parietal cells. Now, why we have this really low pH of acid it helps break apart proteins. It helps activate pepsin, we'll get to in a second. It helps break down plant cell walls. So when you're eating that salad, and it kills lots and lots of bacteria because you're eating stuff covered in bacteria all day long too. It also makes what we call the intrinsic factors. And you're like, well, that doesn't sound very important. It's very important. It's very important. Because the intrinsic factor, it's a protein that allows us to absorb vitamin B12 later on after the stomach and the small intestine. Otherwise, you can be taking vitamin B12 pills, eating foods high in vitamin B12. You wouldn't absorb any of it. It would just pass right through. We need to absorb vit vitamin B12 reason why we need it, because I know it'll come up on a slide, uh, I don't know when, shortly. We need vitamin B12 to make red blood cells. So we need vitamin B12 to get absorbed into our small intestine, into our body, so we can make red blood cells properly. So we need the intrinsic factor, and our stomach makes it. The chief cells also make two things. First thing they make, pepsinogen. Now, anything that has gen in it means it's gonna generate or become something else, like the beginning. So pepsinogen is inactive. It will eventually become active and we take off the gen and then it just becomes pepsin. So it will become pepsin. The chief cells make the pepsinogen. Now, the hydrochloric acid, I need more colors just because the hydrochloric acid the parietal cell makes, makes that happen. Hydrochloric acid will trigger the pepsinogen to become pepsin. 
like, why do we need pepsin anyways? Pepsin, they both start with P, breaks down. Mm, I can shorten it. I'll move. Proteins. They both start with P. Pepsin breaks down proteins. The chief cells make an enzyme called lipase. I see it says it on there. It breaks down lipids. It's an enzyme that breaks down lipids. And this is usually endonase. It breaks down or digests about 15% of the lipids you eat. And then our fourth, our internal endocrine cells. Sometimes, and I'm like, I don't want to know where they get the G from. Sometimes they call them G cells. I don't know. Now, they do have the word endocrine in it. Generally, endocrine is in charge of hormones, the endocrine system. Anything inter means intestines. And so the enteroendocrine cells, they make hormones for the intestines. One of the big ones, again, they act as paracrines. These are hormones, and I'm like, that the intestinal cells make, not the endocrine cells. They're just like, like the endocrine system. And the biggest hormone they make, they make a couple. The only one that I care that you know is they make a hormone called gastrin. So their big thing is they are making hormones, even though they are not technically considered part of the endocrine system. We are still making hormones like the endocrine system does. It's just these hormones are staying in the digestive system. Now, we already said it that yes, the digestive system, specifically the stomach, is not a wonderful place to live. I was gonna say it's got harsh digestive conditions. So we have a mucosal barrier with lots of these bicarbonate rich ions that will trap any of the extra acid so it doesn't penetrate and damage our epithelial cells. We also have tight junctions, meaning the cells are stuck together literally as tight as possible. They are held together in place so that we don't have any of those gastric juices with a low pH seeping underneath the tissues. And if anything does get through and does damage, our epithelial cells divide very, very quickly and replace themselves very, very quickly, usually within about three to six days. So even if you did damage a few cells, a little bit of hydrochloric acid did get through, we can just replace that a few days later. Now, some things that can happen in the stomach though. One, you can have gastritis. It just means an inflammation of the stomach. Anytime you have any type of inflammation that's caused by anything that breaches the mucosal barrier, we call it gastritis. Something happened. You didn't make enough mucus, the acid got through the mucus layer, something happened. Acid will wear, I mean, acid can literally break down nails. It can break down metal. It's going to easily break through and start to break down the actual stomach wall. It doesn't feel good. It causes inflammation, hence gastritis. Now, it's rare that it would ever eat all the way through. It happens, but you'd be in so much pain, you'd be in the hospital before that would probably ever happen. Unless you're in some world country where you can't get to it. But inflammation, gastritis. Peptic or gastric ulcers called either one, most times we just call them ulcers, that stomach wall is completely eroding away. Occasionally it can perforate and you can get the hole. Again, you would be in so much pain that that would, uh, before that would ever happen. Now, one of the, I'm like, imagining this and I'm like, you have your stomach, you have a hole in your stomach, which is never good, but why is that really not good? Yeah, you're going to have stomach acid leaking out of your stomach, you know, because it wore away your stomach. Once it leaks out, what else will it attack? All of your other internal organs. Again, you would be in an extreme amount of pain before that would ever happen. But most stomach ulcers, the fact that we're even awaiting, wearing away at some of the epith epithelial tissue, most ulcers are caused by bacteria. They used to be thought, oh, well, if you have a lot of stress, that's the 
going to cause an ulcer? It doesn't. Stress may increase the amount of acid your stomach makes, and if you already have an ulcer, it will aggravate the ulcer. But stress does not give you an ulcer. Ulcers come from, I was going to say, 95% of ulcers all come from a bacteria called Helicobacter pylori. Now, the interesting part about this particular bacteria, of course, we had to figure out, well, how is it that this, you know, how is it that a bacteria actually causes an ulcer? You know, how can we prove that? Well, the person that did the research on it, it's like, I'll eat some Helicobacter pylori. And then they, yes, like, oh, look, now you have an ulcer. Oh, look, there's the bacteria right there. So the scientist, what a good scientist, ate some of the bacteria to prove it. And it worked. Now, some ulcers are caused by non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Any guess an example? Ibuprofen. Like your Naxaprin sodium, your, your Aleve, these over-the-counter anti-inflammatory drugs. They usually even say somewhere on the label, you know, take with food, don't take too many, stop if your stomach hurts. These anti-inflammatory drugs can actually wear away at the mucus lining, which means acid can now penetrate through. So don't take them for long term. Now, some digestive processes that happen in the stomach. Again, we have got to break down food in here. Some of it's physical digestion. It's the physical churning and breaking apart the food that's in there. Some of it is we're starting to break down proteins because of the hydrochloric acid. We haven't gotten to pepsin yet. But the hydrochloric acid itself denatures the protein and starts to break it down. We're starting to have enzymes breaking things down. Pepsin, which has been activated because of hydrochloric acid, will now start to break down proteins. Now, a different enzyme that infants make is an enzyme called renin. Renin specifically breaks down the protein found in milk, which, if you've ever been spit up on, babies drink milk. When they spit up, does it look the exact same? Nope. Well, usually a little curdy looking. That's because of the renin. The renin is breaking down the milk proteins, and then it comes back up looking a little more cheese curd-like. Um, yay! That's just because of the enzyme that the, that's in the uh, infant's stomach, because that's all they're eating. They're not eating plants and vegetables and any other thing. Like, their main goal is just to break down milk proteins. We also have the enzymes called uh, lipase. Now, it's called lingual lipase, because where did it come from? I was going to say, yes, but from the, say from the lingual salivary gland or the sublingual. It came from the saliva. Now, that saliva that made some of those lingual lipases, there's really not a lot of breaking down of lipids in the mouth, but those enzymes that your saliva make travels with the food. They end up in the stomach, and some of that particular enzyme starts breaking down your triglycerides or some of the fats that you get done eating. By breaking all this stuff down, breaking different types of proteins, starting to break down some of your lipids, by the time your food leaves your stomach, we call it chyme. Again, it doesn't always look recognizable as to whatever it is you ate, because it's further broken down chemically. Now, the only stomach function that we actually need, meaning you could remove your stomach and live without it, just fine, it happens is the fact that we need a parietal cell because we need to make the intrinsic factor. We need the intrinsic factor. We need to absorb vitamin B12. We need it to be, to be able to make red blood cells. If you can't make, if you don't have the intrinsic factor, you can't make red blood cells. It's one way you can develop anemia. There's lots of different types of anemia. Which means if you had to have your stomach removed, you had stomach cancer, or some other severe damage to your stomach, and I'm like, they would have to remove your entire stomach, you can live without your stomach. But they would have to give you vitamin B12 injections because you're not going to absorb it from your food. So you would have to inject it right into your blood supply so that we could make regular red blood cells. Now, to regulate the fact that we're making all these secretions, We've got several things that are going to regulate how much of this gastric juices we should make and when we should stop. Oh, there was my, we make three liters. 
don't know if I said two liters, three liters of gastric juice a day. You think that's, you know, one and a half of those big two liter bottles. So a lot of juices that you're making. You absorb most of it. Now, part of this is nervous system that's going to trigger your stomach to start making this. And some of it is hormonal. There are hormones, they go in gastrin, that's going to trigger the making of all these gastric juices. Nervous system wise, we have vagus nerve stimulation. That's going to increase your secretion. Vagus nerve is talking about nerves in your facial region. And I'm like, in, in your head region. The fact that you actually have food in your mouth, you can feel it inside your oral cavity or you're smooshing it around and chewing it and you're tasting it. That's all part of your vagus nerve. It's like, oh, we have food in our mouth that needs to trigger our stomach to prepare for the food. We start increasing the secretion. The fact that we can even smell the food will increase their stomach secretions. This is why if you walk into a room, all of a sudden you can smell like popcorn. Your stomach starts to gurgle. That's your vagus nerve. That's like, ooh, popcorn. I wonder if we're going to get some. And it starts to increase your gastric juices in the hopes that you get some of that. So even seeing food, not even smelling it or eating it yet, seeing food can start increasing your gastric juices. Which, yes, that means you can feel, you know, hear your stomach churning around. Now, your sympathetic nervous system will decrease your stimulation. When does the sympathetic nervous system kick in? When you're under stress. Again, when you're under stress, whether you're running from a bear or you're stressed out because of whatever's happening in your life, you're generally not going to make as much gastric juices. You still may make lots of acids, but I'm like, but you're not going to make as much volume of gastric juices. Again, digesting is not a top priority when you're under a lot of stress. And then the hormonal control, the big one, the stomach makes gastrin, and then gastrin, the hormone itself, will increase the amount of enzymes that are made, and it will increase the amount of hydrochloric acid that are made. So it will start saying, let's make more of this, let's make some more of that. The cells will start to say, let's start to make more of it. Now, the small intestine, which we haven't quite gotten to, the small intestine, since gastri the gastrin hormone increases the making of gastric juices, hormone that says, let's make more, we've got food to break down. The small intestine has various secretions that are going to inhibit gastrin production. By the time food gets into the intestines, the stomach's job is done. We don't want it to make any more gastric juices. So when food's starting to get in the intestine, it tells the stomach, okay, I'm receiving your food, we're done. You can, you know, quiet down now, we're good. Now, the three phases of gastric secretion. The first phase, I already kind of talked about it because of the vagus nerve. Our first phase of gastric secretion is the cephalic phase. It's a reflex phase. It's again, because you're smelling food, tasting food, seeing food, or even thinking about food. You're going to increase your gastric secretions. It's all reflex. You can't smell food and then tell your stomach not to make any more gastric secretions. The gastric phase, anything gastro means stomach. This is by the time the food is in your stomach. So it's churning around, mixing around, uh, trying to break everything down. It can last about three to four hours, kind of depends on what you ate and how much. And during this time, about two thirds of your gastric juice is produced. We're actively trying to break all of that down inside of there. Now, the things that stimulate this gastric phase, distension, the stretching of your stomach, you're full. It's stretching out, uh, it's stretching. Peptides, which are found in proteins. So if you've got protein in your diet, low acidity, it just means you've made hydrochloric acid. I'm like, gastrin, the hormone, that's a big one that's telling the stomach uh, to make those gastric juices. The enteroendocrine cells, these things that make more gastrin are stimulated by caffeine, proteins, and rising pH. If your pH gets too high, we want it to go back down. We want a low pH in the stomach. And so these enteroendocrine cells that make gastrin, like they're, they're regulating, you know, they're kind of monitoring things. They'll make more gastrin. We'll start to make more hydrochloric acid. We'll start to make more enzymes. And we'll get everything back to normal to start breaking things down. Now, oh, I got to, I have to erase, I have to draw. But I kind of want to leave that up there. We'll draw over here. 
is how do we make the hydrochloric acid? Now, here's my awesome drawing. It's the stomach. You all got it. Then there are some cells here. In case you didn't get it, we'll label it. And just because I want another color. So there's some cells that hang out. So we're pretending there's just some cells here. And then we're going to have blood vessels. Because we've got blood vessels everywhere. So there's going to be blood vessels hanging around the stomach as well. Now, the first thing that's going to happen before I draw anything else, H2CO3, any, oh, I got that. Your carbonic acid will get broken down. Now, it, get bro it gets broken down into two things. Hydrogen ions and what? What's left after I remove one hydrogen? I heard mumbling. HCO3, and it's negative because we split them up. What is that? There's your bicarbonate. Here's your hydrogen ion. So first we're going to break this down. Now, what our stomach will do, once I've broken it down, I will keep it at black. Our parietal cells, whose main job, well, not main job, one of their big jobs, one of their two, is to make hydrochloric acid. So they are going to take, I'm like, the parietal cells are going to take the hydrochloric acid that was broken down from that, and I'm like, and they are going to pump it into the stomach. We have hydrogen ions going inside the stomach. The stomach lumen, the lumen is like the opening. It's in the stomach. Now, we have something positive going in. So what has to leave? Something positive. Something positive goes in, something positive has to leave. We have to equal it out. In this case, we're going to have potassium ions that are going to leave in from our stomach and go into some of these neighboring cells. Positive goes in, positive goes out, we're back to, we're back even. Now, the bicarbonate, that other thing that came from the carbonic acid, is going to leave, and it's going to head all the way over into the blood. Now, something negative left. So what has to go in? Something positive or negative? Negative. Something negative leaves, something positive has to go back in. I'm like, to be able to equal it back out. So the thing that's going to go back in, it's going to come from our blood, are chloride ions. So chloride's going to leave our blood and head back in there because they're also a negative charge. Now, two big things that we've just done. One, we now have a whole bunch of bicarbonate ions which are alkaline, basic, going into the blood. So the blood that's traveling past the stomach, there's my traveling, the blood that's traveling past the stomach is going to be more alkaline. So the blood that leaves the stomach region is going to be more alkaline. It's called the alkaline tide. As blood is flowing past the stomach, it is picking up bicarbonate ions and it's becoming more alkaline. Alkaline tide. Now, the other thing that's happened, what two things went into the stomach? Hydrogen and chloride. If we put H and Cl together, what have we just made? HCl, we've just made hydrochloric acid. Yay! One of the big jobs of parietal cells is to make hydrochloric acid. That's where it comes from. It's coming really from the breakdown of our carbonic acid. And yes, our breathing regulates how much carb you know, carbonic acid is in our blood system. So the respiratory system and our digestive system are related. You wouldn't normally think that there's a relation between respiratory and digestive. I mean, yes, everything needs oxygen as well, but 
The fact that we can make our stomach acid, our hydrochloric acid, comes from that carbonic acid. Now, the other thing that regulates our gastrin secretion. So we see things, and then we've got our food in our stomach that's going to increase secretions. The third thing that regulates all those gastric secretions is food in the intestinal phase. Now, there's a really short stimulatory phase that as food, you know, some of this partially digested food is going into the small intestine, you're going to get a little quick rise of extra gastric juices. So just the fact that we're starting to get some food into the intestine, it's not all there, it doesn't all travel at once, but as food is going in there, you're going to get a little rise in your gastric secretions. The majority of our intestinal phase is inhibitory. We are trying to, once that food goes in the intestine, we are trying to tell our stomach to stop making gastric juices. Our stomach, all of those juices are very acidic. Our stomach can handle the acid. Is our intestine made to handle that low pH? No, and I'm like, so I mean, there's a few things that can do right away at the first part of the intestine to try to handle it, but our intestine is not made to handle a pH of two or three or less. And so it's the inhibitory effect. It's a reflex using the hormones that just says, stop. Anytime you have chyme, that's that fluid now, that has lots of hydrogen ions, it's acidic when it ends in, enters in the intestine. When you have lots of fats, proteins, and the peptides, or any type of irritating substance, it will tell the stomach to stop making the gastric juices. We're not going to watch the little video. It just goes over those three things. I'll include the link online. And so the internal gastric reflexes all together, and like the reflexes will go back and tell the intestine to close down. So there's three reflexes that all work together. Again, you have no control over your reflexes. They'll activate your sympathetic fibers, again, when you're under stress. Not when you're always under stress, but they activate the sympathetic fibers because we are trying to stop things. They're going to tighten the pyloric sphincter. Where do we find the pyloric sphincter? Like at the bottom here, I could have drawn it a little line right there. You know, as food's going through, it's going to tighten the pyloric sphincter so that we will stop food from going in the intestine. So we're receiving food, and if we're starting to receive too much, and I'm like, we can close that off to stop food from going in. It will also tell the stomach to decrease all their gastric activity. Again, this is a lot of stomach acid. The intestine doesn't like it. And so if it's starting to receive too much food that has a low pH, it will one, try to close off that sphincter, and two, is going to sit there and tell the stomach to stop making juices because it doesn't want it anymore. Now, I was going to say, there's still something that will happen if it receives more, but there are hormones, because we'll get into more on the enterogastro next time, but there are other additional hormones that can be released by your small intestine. It's called the secretin and cholecystokinin. We'll get more into them next time, so I'm not that worried that you know about them today. Um, just be like, oh, that's right, they're, they're hormones produced by the small intestine. Their main job is to inhibit gastrin secretion, to inhibit the making of gastric juices. Now, if the small intestine is pushed to accept more food, you know, even though we tried to close this off, we tried to reduce the amount of acid that's being produced, but the stomach forces food into the small intestine. It's called a dumping syndrome. <laughs> it's sending food into the small intestine that it, it doesn't want. What this will cause, and you probably have all experienced this, it usually causes nausea and vomiting. The small intestine is receiving too much acidic food. It cannot neutralize it. And instead of damaging the small intestine, the body's response is, let's vomit and get rid of it all. Now, Mike, so we don't damage the small intestine. This can happen after you eat, you know, certain foods that are acidic. I'm like, after you eat, I'm like, too much of something, I'm like, that all of a sudden your stomach is putting too much food in the intestine. All of a sudden you're like, wow, you know, I'm just really nauseous. I didn't eat anything weird. And I'm like, all of a sudden your stomach is just pushing too much food in the intestine. You can feel nauseous and vomit. Now, people that have gastric reduction, where they've actually, you know, banded off or removed part of their stomach itself, 
some of that food naturally goes from the stomach and into the intestine too fast. And I'm like, so that happens more often for people that have gastric reduction or the clamping around the, uh, the stomach itself. Now, big picture, lots of stuff in your book if you'd like to look at it, because it's probably really tiny if you printed it. It's in your book on page 871. Everything that's on here on the left side, these are all stimulatory things that are going to make your stomach produce more gastric secretions. There's still the three phases, I'm like, but there's lots of things that are going to say, let's make more gastric juices. Everything on this side. This is all inhibitory, inhibitory, meaning these are all things that are telling the stomach, stop making gastric juices. You know, we've got too much. So there's kind of a whole, lots and lots of things that, in, that, I'm like, that increase and decrease the amount of gastric juices. Now, some other things with your stomach, away from hormones a little bit. Your stomach can stretch quite a bit. So it can stretch. It's made of smooth muscle. Smooth muscle is very stretchy. Uh, it doesn't, you know, I'm going to say it can stretch quite a bit before the pressure on the, on the muscle really is getting, you know, stretched too far and you can start to feel that increase of pressure. Your pressure on that actual stomach wall stays the same until you have, you know, up until one and a half liters of food, which means you can eat approximately, it's all different between everyone, approximately a liter and a half of food and drink, and you may not feel full. It's because the stomach is getting larger, but not large enough that it's not increased the pressure enough on that stomach wall. So you don't generally feel full until you've had at least a liter and a half of food and drink. Then, you know, Mike, it increases the pressure and you feel full. Now, the fact that it stretches and doesn't increase pressure is called gastric accommodation. And I'm like, so I'm like, it can stretch just fine. And even if you feel full, can you still keep eating? Oh, yeah. And I'm like, you know, it kind of depends, you know, how full are you really feeling? If you're full, you can still keep eating. You're like, this is so good. And you just keep eating. Your stomach can stretch even larger. It can hold, I'm like, I wrote it down. It was like a gallon and a half um, of fluid. I wrote it down somewhere. I don't remember. And I'm like, a gallon and a half of food. And I'm like, that's a lot. I mean, it's not a gallon and a half. A gallon? You think of a gallon jug of milk? It can get that large. Generally, I'm like, you're going to be like, feel like you're going to want to roll down, you know, the, the hallway or something. That usually happens, you know, Christmas dinner when you just want to eat everything. And I'm like, and it feels so uncomfortable. Well, yeah, you just ate like a gallon of food and beverage um, to fill that all the way up. But it can stretch that big. Now, while food is in there, we know it's going to be sitting there squishing and churning and everything else, and eventually we want to get the food out of the stomach and into the small intestine. Now, those stomach walls, those three layers of muscles, as they are squeezing, they are moving the food, you know, top down. I'm just going to erase a lot of this. I'm like, they're going to move the food down toward the pylorus region into the intestine. Oh, I'm just going to erase it all. So here's your stomach. I know I've got a picture. It's so pretty. Beautiful. So it's going to sit there and squeeze and squeeze and squeeze, and it is going to try to push it through the pyloric sphincter that's here and get it into the small intestine. Now, it, as it squeezes, you know, as, yes, it's churning, but as it squeezes down to the bottom, it kind of does, you know, three squeezes per minute. Now, that doesn't mean all the food gets dumped all at once, but it is a coordinated movement, and so we do have pacemaker cells that are coordinating the muscle contraction so that the whole muscle is going to contract to push food out, or try to. Where else do we find pacemaker cells? heard it. In the heart. Now, the pacemaker cells in the heart, give it a nice rhythm. Well, this gives it a rhythm. The whole thing will contract about three times per minute. They all coordinate together. They all coordinate together. And in the heart, it's coordinated to pump and move blood through. Well, this is coordinated to pump 
and move food through. Now, distension, fancy way of saying the stretching of the stomach, and gastric hormones will increase the force of the contraction. So if this is stretched really big, you just got done eating that Christmas dinner, and I'm like, or a really big dinner, you've got a lot of food in the stomach, the stretched out it is, the more forceful it will actually contract to try to move food out. The hormone itself, the gastrin, will make those contractions really hard to try to move food out. The most vigorous contraction happens down in the pylorus region, that bottom region where it's really trying to squeeze food because this pyloric sphincter is usually closed and we have to push it through it. Now, you either have one of two fates. You're either gonna leave or you're gonna go right backwards. So we're gonna push all the food to the end, but only about three milliliters of food actually trickles into the small intestine, the very first part, with every contraction. That's it. Three milliliters is not very much. It's like, you know, if I had a little tiny beaker, it'd be like that much. I'm like, it's not a lot of food, which is fine. And I'm like, if you had too much going into the small intestine, what would happen? You'd have the nausea and vomiting. It'd be too acidic. And so even though everything squeezes, and I've got a picture, and I'm like, everything squeezes to try to push all the food that's in here at the time, and only about three, three milliliters goes actually into the duodenum. The rest of it, it's like, oh, we didn't make it in. Let's go backwards. It gets turned around again, and it has to wait for another peristaltic contraction, and another three milliliters will go in the next time. Here's a picture. So we've got our peristaltic contraction. It's trying to squeeze and pump and eventually try to put, push as much food down into this pylorus region at a time, and only about three milliliters goes in, and the rest is called retropulsion. And I'm like, instead of going forward, it goes backwards. And then it gets all churned all up again. And then it has to wait for another peristaltic contraction to possibly go into the small intestine. Now, as this chyme starts to go into the small intestine, three milliliters a time, there are receptors in the duodenum, the very first part of the small intestine, that are responding to the stretch of the fact that we have food coming in right now. And the fact that we were responding to the stretch, and I'm like, we have chemicals, we have acidic chemicals from our chyme going into the small intestine. And I'm like, we now start getting this reflex. It's like, oh, we're receiving food that's acidic. It's going to try to inhibit gastric secretion. I'm like, it will sit there and be like, okay, we're receiving food. We don't want a lot more, more acid being made. I'm like, otherwise you end up with too much acidic. It will also try to inhibit duodenal filling. So again, you're only getting three milliliters at a time. Now, interesting part, there are some foods that will actually move from the stomach into the small intestine faster than others. Carbohydrate-rich chyme moves quickly through the duodenum. Doesn't usually hang out there very long. So if you just got done eating a bunch of carbs, you know, a bunch of bread, you know, gets turned up into the small intestine and it gets in from the duodenum into the rest of the small intestine very, very quickly. Fatty chyme, if you just got done going to McDonald's and you eat your Big Mac and whatever else and whatever else has got a lot of fat in it, and I'm like, that fatty chyme, because it's like thicker, it's harder to break down, it usually hangs out in the stomach and the duodenum for six hours or more. So it's the last thing to leave the stomach and the duodenum, I'm like, is the fatty chyme. It just takes longer for it to break down. It's more sluggish to try to push out. And I'm like, so it hangs out there longer. Now, some things that can happen with this is again, not all food can go all the way down, you know, one way. Occasionally what can happen is vomiting or emesis caused by extreme stretching one of the stomach if you really ate that much, or extreme stretching of the duodenum it accepted too much food that it shouldn't have. Other things that can cause uh, vomiting is intestinal irritants. If you ate something that just doesn't agree with you, something maybe too spicy. Um, bacterial toxins, if you ate something that's got lots of bacteria in it, um, you, you end up with the food poisoning. Excessive alcohol can make you vomit. Uh, drugs can make you vomit. These are all things that can cause vomiting. 
Now, I'm like, I know I'm going to talk about it. Do, 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 do. I was going to say what? What? <laughs> All of this information eventually goes to the medulla. Why are some things the medulla oblongata controls? Breathing? Another big one? Breathing and the heart. And I'm like, your heart rate? And I'm like, and so those are two big things, which is why you die if you damage the medulla. But another lesser known one that it does control, it does control vomiting as well. Now excessive vomiting, which can happen, I'm like, you've got some type of irritant, you know, you just can't stop vomiting. If you've ever had some type of food poisoning, maybe you feel like you've gotten this point, things that can happen. One is dehydration, because you're losing lots and lots of fluids. You can also have electrolyte and acid-based imbalances. One, you're losing lots of electrolytes, because I'm like, well, I wasted it already. But you're losing lots of chloride, you're losing lots of hydrogen, you're losing lots of other things that went into your food to kind of help break down the food. And you can have acid-based imbalances. You can end up with something known as alkalosis. Your stomach is constantly trying to make hydrochloric acid. It's always trying to make hydrochloric acid. Well, if you just keep vomiting that hydrochloric acid up, it has to make more hydrochloric acid, which means you can all of a sudden start to become alkaline. Your blood starts to become a little alkaline, which means it might get too high on the pH scale that it starts to cause damage because you're throwing up the acid, so you start to become basic. Now, other reflex that happen with vomiting. One, there are some things that happen that all of a sudden you realize that you're like, I think I'm going to vomit. Other than that weird feeling, one, you start to make more saliva. Any guess why we make more saliva before we vomit? It's a what? Yes, it's, it's for protection against the acidity. What part is getting protected that we want to protect? We don't swallow it usually. I'm like, usually it's the teeth. Um, so if you're like, oh, I'm not feeling good, and all of a sudden you start spitting a lot, there you go. And I'm like, you start to make extra saliva. It's really there to try to coat the teeth, to try to protect that enamel from the strong acid. Um, so you've got excessive salivating. Um, usually you go really pale. Now, the actual act of vomiting, I don't know if I've got a picture. I'm going to go ahead just because I want a picture. I'm not going to draw on it, though. Here is your stomach. Yes, the liver is here. But what also covers right here? The diaphragm covers right here. So you're like, well, how is it that we can get food from here to go all the way up there? There's lots of sphincters. Sphincters are to prevent backflow. So that means we have to generate enough pressure to push that food, food, whatever we want to call it at that point. And I'm like, against all of those sphincters and get all the way out. Most of that pressure is generated from the diaphragm. That diaphragm, which when relaxed is kind of a bell-shaped curve, it will contract, it will flatten out, and I'm like, and it will push on the stomach. It can push hard enough, it will generate enough pressure on the stomach that the stomach doesn't like that extra pressure, and food will go back up. So a lot of the extra pressure on your stomach is all because of the diaphragm. Now, yes, holding your breath and a mic and, you know, clenching on your stomach can also increase that abdominal pressure that can also try to push down on the stomach. Now, it's not only food that's in the stomach that gets thrown up. Food from the duodenum can get emptied into the stomach and also go up. This is, and I'm like, and we'll get it to, because I'm like, we've got bile that dumps in right here. If you've ever thrown up enough and, like, I don't know, like the fourth time you've thrown up, all you're throwing up is bile at that point. That's any time you have bile, that means you now are throwing up things that were in the duodenum, things that were thrown up in the small intestine. Not in the stomach. We do not have bile anywhere in the stomach. And I'm like, that all comes from the small intestine. Oh, I was going to say my other little note. Now, also when we uh, throw up, one, there is, I say, the soft palate, in theory, the soft palate at the back of your throat should rise to try to block off your nasal your nasopharynx region and your nasal cavity? Does it always work, though? No. And I'm like, our, our body does try to block that off. It does try to rise that soft palate, try to block off the nasal cavity. But if it's forceful enough vomiting, it will just blow that little soft palate out of the way. And now it's going out your nose, too. Yay. Now, small intestine. It is the major organ of digestion 
and the biggest organ for absorption. So we've been digesting food as we've been going on so far. You know, some digestion happens in the mouth, some of it happens in the stomach, a lot more of it's going to happen in the small intestine, we're breaking foods down, but we haven't absorbed anything yet until we get to the small intestine. Now, small intestine goes all the way from the pyloric sphincter, the end part of the stomach, all the way to the ileal cecal valve, which connects small intestine to the cecum, which is the first part of the large intestine. And there are three divisions, the duodenum, the deju jejunum, and the ileum. The duodenum, it is the shortest of the three parts. Imagine there's a stomach right here. It's just a loop. It's about 10 inches, you know, about. And I'm like, it's just this one little loop. That's it. But of the three parts, the most interesting. Although it's the shortest, it's still the most interesting. Main, main reason why it's the most interesting, because in the duodenum, you have bile that's coming from the gallbladder or liver and is getting dumped into the duodenum. You also have pancreatic juices coming from the pancreas, also getting uh, dropped off. They both form and get dropped off in the exact same hole. And I'm like, but you've got lots of different juices that are getting dropped off in the duodenum region. Again, bile is coming in here. So if you're throwing up bile, it's because it's food that's in the duodenum. So you've got lots of things that are going in there. Shortest part, interesting part though, because of the secretions coming from the liver and the pancreas. Now, the jejunum, because we don't really talk about it a lot. Here we go, here's my one slide on the jejunum and the ileum. Um, the jejunum just goes from the duodenum to the ileum, and it's about eight feet. Whee. The ileum goes, I was gonna say, it joins the large intestine, so it ends at the jejunum, and then it joins up with the large intestine at the ileocecal valve, and it's about 12 feet. About, depends on the person. Yay. Now, <laughs> inside, they both kind of do the exact same thing. And inside, since we've got lots of absorption, absorption, we need lots of surface area. So in our small intestine, we have folds on top of folds on top of folds, literally. We have circular folds. I'm going to just go straight to my picture. We have circular folds. These are permanent folds inside your intestine. So if you look inside your intestine, you're going to see these permanent folds in there. Now, if I zoomed in on these folds, hence I did, you know, big folds right here. If I zoom in, the folds have folds. These are your villi, little finger-like projections that are on every single circular fold. So folds on top of folds. We're going to zoom in on that one villi so we can get our next fold. Here's that one little finger-like villi. If we zoom in on that, on the top surface of the villi, you have more folds. They're called microvilli because they're, um, they're smaller and they're on top of the villi. So they're microvilli. And it's in that microvilli, those extra folds on top of the folds, we, we have cells that are going to be producing various secretions. And so a lot of times we'll call them brush border cells. If, if when you're here next time, I'm like, I'm talking about brush border cells. There we go. It's the, the cells in the microvilli, the folds on top of the folds, which are on top of the folds. Again, lots and lots of surface area. Now, in all of these folds, we have intestinal crypts. There you go, Mike. So we've got all these folds, but we also have these little indents called intestinal crypts. And I'm like, it kind of almost looks like the stomach where you have little pits and glands. We just call them crypts because they're not technically generating anything. There are some cells that produce juice, but not a ton. Not like the, the stomach. Now, the cells in the, F, the intestinal crypts renew themselves about every two to four days. Means, you know, they make a new cell, it dies. They make another new cell two, three, you know, two, three, four days later. That's constantly renewing cells. A lot of them get sloughed off as food is going by. Some of them are dying because of the acid that's coming from the stomach. And I'm like, they kind of have to withstand a lot of things. Now, some of the cells that make intestinal juices, we've got enteroendocrine cells that make enterogastrone. These are hormones and an own, no, and I'm like, they're hormones that are helping regulate the, the intestine and the stomach. Also found in our intestinal crypts, we've got intraepithelial lymphocytes. 
big mouthful. Now, what do you think of when you think of a lymphocyte, or when have we heard of lymphocytes before? It's one of the white blood cells. Now, even though this is not the blood, we, uh, we still have lymphocytes in our intestinal wall. These are there to kill infected cells. If we have cells that are infected with viruses or bacteria, we have like our own little immune system going on in our intestine. We also have PANA cells found here that secrete antimicrobial agents, again, to kill any type of bacteria that you ate and we don't want it to infect the rest of our cells. And I'll just say, yes, stem cells, they divide every two to four days to produce all of these crypt cells. Now, one thing that you may know is that people that are undergoing chemotherapy, what's one of the big side effects of chemotherapy? Well, yes, you're gonna lose your hair. A lot of them are nauseous with chemotherapy. Main reason with chemotherapy, the drugs that are in your chemotherapy, they target cancer cells. Cancer cells, all their cancer cells are reproducing and nothing's telling them to stop. So chemotherapy drugs, their main job is to kill rapidly reproducing cells, because that's what cancer cells are doing, is rapidly reproducing cells. But in the intestine, we have cells that are re reproducing every two to four days. That's a rapidly reproducing cell. So chemotherapy drugs are actually killing cells in your intestinal wall because they just target any type of cells that are reproducing really fast, such as cancerous cells. But the side effect is they're also killing cells in the intestine because they repro uh, reproduce so quickly. So they do kill cancer cells, but they also reproduce rapidly dividing cells, which can trigger the nausea, the vomiting, and the diarrhea is the side effects with chemotherapy. So if you ever wonder why people are nauseous with chemotherapy, because it's targeting those rapidly reproducing cells. We'll end right there.